Hi, everyone. How are you doing? My name is Peter. I am the New York City Chapter Director for Startup Grind, and I have the privilege of introducing a New York-based charity, um, Charity Water, and particularly the founder, Scott Harrison. Um, this is a story that's very personal to me because I was a Peace Corps volunteer for three years. I'm really excited to hear Scott tell his story, and I hope you are too. Scott? How are you doing? Thanks for coming. All right. Hey, guys. I haven't even said anything yet. Uh, it was awesome. We were just talking backstage. Uh, he was in the Peace Corps and saw uh, the need for water in Burkina Faso, so that was very cool. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to show a lot of pictures, so can we bring the lights down a little bit? Uh, so excited. Excellent. Now you don't have to look at me, but you get to look at the photos. Uh, super excited to talk about Charity Water, uh, a little bit of some of the things we've learned over the last eight years in building it. Uh, I'll start with a little backstory. Uh, I came to the nonprofit world by way of nightlife. Uh, at 18 years old, I rebelled from a very conservative uh, Christian household, said, to heck with everybody, I am going to drink for a living. Moved to New York City, this job actually exists. And uh, for the next 10 years, I climbed up the social ladder. I wanted to become the, you know, the kingpin of New York nightlife. And 10 years later, uh, I got pretty close. This was me in the VIP room uh, with my business partner. We were getting paid $2,000 a month by Bacardi just to drink Bacardi, another $2,000 a month by Budweiser to drink Budweiser. And this picture shows the miserable condition of my soul because I'm holding out my Rolex watch so that the club photographer notices my expensive watch. I was the biggest idiot that I knew. And I'm at, uh, yeah, yeah, case in point. So it looked very glamorous. It was not very uh, glamorous, you know, at five or six in the morning at some disgusting after hours, you know, huddled over a, a plate of cocaine. So uh, 10 years later, uh, at 28, I came to my senses and I was on the, the perfect trip in New Year's Eve. Uh, I was in Punta del Este in Uruguay with all the beautiful people. And I realized uh, I was the selfish, sycophantic, horrible human being. And I was leaving a legacy of just getting people wasted for my entire life. So I began to uh, assess my life. I began to rediscover a very lost faith in a different way. And it led me to sell all my possessions a couple months later and apply to the great humanitarian organizations of the world. I said, you know, Mr. Harrison, the nightclub promoter is now ready for you. Uh, I would like to volunteer. As you can probably imagine, I was denied by every single organization that I applied to because I got people drunk for a living. And finally, one organization said that if I paid them $500 a month, I could go to Liberia on their mission. Nobody believes this. I'd never heard of Liberia. I thought Africa was a country, not made up of many countries, over 40 countries. Uh, and I said, here are my credit card details. I'd love to help. And you know, I want to give a year of the 10 that I just selfishly wasted in service to others. So I'd applied to be their volunteer photojournalist, their kind of storyteller. And went into this country, uh, we've, we, this, now the story is uh, Ebola. Back then it was the 14-year civil war uh, led by Charles Taylor that had ended. So we came in with 14,000 UN peacekeeping troops. I was teamed up with a bunch of doctors. And I saw just the most broken country. Uh, and we were operating on this big hospital ship. So we would bring people onto the ship and we would help them. Liberia had no public electricity, no running water, no sewage, and no mail. And people were living in apartment buildings that looked like this. They were living in houses without roofs, without windows. And probably the most important thing that I saw in the year that eventually turned into two years of service was the fact that people didn't even have clean water to drink. And thousands of people would turn up to see our doctors. We would rent out football stadiums, soccer stadiums, and people in the villages didn't even have the most basic need met. So after this two-year, very transformative experience where I basically spent uh, most of the time just weeping, just in grief for uh, stuff that I'd never seen before. You know, I was selling $10 bottles of water in my nightclubs, and I was watching kids die of diarrhea uh, from the most preventable diseases. So I came back to New York with the idea for Charity Water after this two-year humanitarian tour. And I'll talk a little bit about water, but not really through statistics, which is how most uh, charities you know, typically convey facts. 
Uh, for those of you that care, this is the top level fact right now. 750 million people have no clean water. Uh, for us, that has become very personal as we've gone out and we have met many of those people. This is John Bosco, and he lives in Rwanda in a village with no water. And this is the only water he's known his entire life. Wakes up in the morning, goes into this swamp, gets his water, takes it home for his family. As you can imagine, if you drink water like this, you get sick. And there are a lot of waterborne diseases, some you've heard of, like cholera or E. coli. Maybe you have not heard of schistosomiasis, which is just a fancy word for parasites or worms, uh, infecting about 200 million people right now, as the, the worms crawl towards their liver. This is actually what that looks like. Uh, we saw this child in Kenya drinking water from a river, and every time she would drink from this little bottle, she would throw up in her shirt. And we watched this in horror for a few minutes and uh, took the water away from her, promised to try to help her village. But I wanted to actually know, I wanted to kind of figure out what was in the water. You know, it wasn't just the dirt. So we took it back to New York, we put it under a microscope, and uh, made a video of the water. She was drinking water that was alive. No child should have to drink water that is alive, that is replicating before our eyes. In the communities we visited, we would learn that leeches were a huge problem. Okay, I bet nobody in this room has ever had to drink water with leeches in it, but community after community would hold out their hands, they'd say, you know, we're getting water from these open springs, the big leeches are never a problem because we can filter them out through our clothes, through the scarves, uh, through the cloth that we filter the water with. But sometimes the little ones will get through the filtration, they grow up inside, and they crawl up to the back of the throat. And you know, the first couple times you hear this, you're like, come on, guys. Time and time and time again, we would hear this. And the parents would say, there are two ways that we get the leeches from the backs of the throats of our children. We either use a stick and pry off the leech, but we have to kill it or it just crawls back up again. Or we'll give our kid a little bit of diesel fuel to scald the leech and hopefully you know, not too much that they're sick. Seen a lot uh, now in the eight years that we've been doing this, uh, learned that half of the world's schools did not have clean water or toilets. Okay, if there was a second issue I would have gone after, it was probably education. But how good of an education could you get if you are walking for dirty water? If you're a teenage girl, you get your period, and there is no toilet at the school. There's no water at the school. You spend your time walking for water if you're a teenage girl. 40 billion hours are wasted just in Africa fetching water that is not even clean. It's not even useful or helpful water. Of all of the stories that I've heard, there's one that touched me on a personal level uh, the most deeply over the entire time that we've been working with Charity Water. I was, uh, I've been to Ethiopia 23 times uh, over the last few years, and I was there in a really crappy $6 night hotel room a couple years back, and the hotel owner comes out and starts telling me a story of a girl that lived in his village 10 years ago. He said she didn't have the yellow jerry can that you saw there. She had a clay pot which weighed 20 pounds, even without the water. And he said she used to walk eight hours a day for bad water. He said one day she walks back into his village, and she slips and she falls, and she breaks her clay pot, and all of the water spills out on the sand. He said rather than go back, she took the rope uh, that tied the clay pot to her back, and she hung herself from a tree in the middle of his village. And he let that sit with our little group, and he said, the work you guys are doing, it's important. And he walked back in the kitchen. I thought about this for a while. I was like, man, that's probably not true. And through our local partner organization, we found out that it was true. We found out that her name was Leta Kiros. And last year, you know, I really wanted to go and find out more about her story. I wanted to walk in her footsteps. I wanted to see her grave, and I wanted to see the tree. So I did. Uh, I went to Ethiopia. I rented a donkey. Uh, I had to hike nine hours over the mountains into her village uh, with a camel that was carrying water because it was completely off the grid, and there, no, there was no clean water. Got there, pitched my tent next to the chief's hut, and spent the next week learning about this amazing girl's story. I met her mom the next morning. I met her best friend who told me about the clay pot this is actually the girl, Yeshreg, who walked with her 10 years ago. And she said, we took a fork, I went home, she went right, I never saw her again. Took me down to the spot where they got the water, and the village made a 2,800 people living at the top of a plateau. The water was down this treacherous footpath, 
and it was just a disgusting little spring. And there were a line of jerry cans because the yield was so low and just a little water seeping out from the rock. And there were women lined up waiting for enough water to come out. Some of them knew who she was. They remembered her story. And then they took me up and they said, uh, many years ago, this is where we found her body. What I didn't know before I went there was that she was 13 years old. She was not a woman. She was a girl. And I asked her best friend, I said, why do you think she killed herself? Why didn't she just go back for the water? And she said, no. It wasn't that she didn't want to go back for the water. It was that she felt she let her mom down because her mom was waiting on that water to cook dinner. And it was the shame of not being able to face her family because she had been careless and she'd slipped and she'd fallen. Seen a lot of stuff coming out of that fired me up to be able to help. You know, this is not about statistics. It's about people that have names, they have faces. And there are 13-year-old girls walking right now eight hours a day in despair. While some of us buy bottled water we don't even need. It was a solvable problem. So I was an optimist. And if you were solution agnostic, uh, we actually know how to solve the entire world water crisis. Not a single person on Earth needs to not have clean water to drink. And sometimes you can dig wells or drill wells or build rainwater systems or spring protections or filtering systems. Uh, at its cheapest, about $65 in Southeast Asia can take dirty surface water like this, pour it into a filter that the community members actually make themselves. They contribute the money to it. Dirty water goes in, clean water comes out that you or I could drink. And in fact, I did. I drank this glass. I was completely fine. One of the more common solutions, and sometimes even a horrible irony, is that there is clean groundwater underneath the feet of the people living there. And for about $10,000, you can bring in about a million dollars of drilling rig equipment. And you just drill. Eight skilled drillers, about three days. And it is one of the most amazing things to be a part of. When a community gets clean water for the first time in the history of that community, for about $10,000. There's dancing, there are parties, sometimes it lasts for hours, sometimes even more than a day. And we believe that water has the ability to change everything. It is transformative for the health, right? If kids are drinking clean water, they're not drinking water with leeches or from swamps and ponds, they are healthier. If their schools have clean water, if their schools have toilets, it makes an impact on education. They're better students. Probably the main beneficiary are just the women. It's the, unfortunately the job of the women and their girls to get the water throughout the developing world. And the women, this has always struck me over the years, instead of talking about how dirty the water was, they talk about the time that they saved. And we'll hear these amazing stories of women starting small businesses, selling rice or selling peanuts at the market. Sometimes being able to give eight hours a day times seven hours, 56 hours back to a woman in a week. It's a transformative thing in her life, a transformative thing in the community life. Um, thank you, guys. So we hear a lot, too, that they're just better moms. And we're able to spend more time with our children and with our families. A um, lot of cool economic data that's been coming out of the United Nations recently, uh, out of the World Health Organization. Right? Water makes people healthier, but it also makes them wealthier. Every dollar invested in water and toilets, water and sanitation, yields four to 12 times to the local economy. They found in some rural villages a 20x impact. Imagine investing a million dollars and making that community $20 million richer, or that region. Probably my favorite story um, over the years was the story of this amazing woman named Helen Appio. If, uh, if you have a 13-year-old girl hanging herself in despair on one end of the spectrum, you have Helen on the other end of the spectrum. And uh, we had done a, a water point in her village. Our team was there. Becky, our water program director, said, Helen, you know, tell us, how's your life different now? You have clean water. It's right near your house. You have all the water you want. And Helen told her this story. She said, you know, before, I used to make choices every single day. Never enough water to do what I needed to do. And I would decide, do I cook? Do I clean? You know, do I wash my kids' school uniforms? Do I wash my husband's clothes? How do I use the water? She said, as a, as a mother, 
as the woman of the house, I always put my family first, and there was never enough for me. And she said, now that there's enough water for the first time in my life, I feel beautiful. Because there's enough water for my face and my body and my clothes. And we'd never thought of that before. Something so simple, just the, the ability of, you know, honestly, guys, something most of us take for granted every single day. To be able to make a woman feel beautiful, to restore dignity, so powerful. So I started the organization eight years ago. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. I'd come back from Liberia, I, I was broke, nightclub promoters don't know how to save money, we know how to spend it, and I was living on a friend's couch, but I really wanted to be a part of ending the water crisis in my lifetime. You know, I didn't want my kids or my grandkids to grow up in a world where some guy like me came into their school or their company or their conference and showed pictures of people across the world drinking water that would kill them. I also wanted to change the way people thought about giving, about charity. And I actually thought to solve a problem this big, we would need to reinvent charity. We would need to get all these people who didn't trust charity and get them to, to care about giving, to care about others, and to trust the system. As I was talking to my friends, I realized you know, there's this black hole mentality. People would say, I, I like to give, but I don't know where my money is going to go. How much will actually reach the people on the ground? And my friends had these you know, excuses. They had horror stories of the charity that hired the mothers and brothers and cousins and spent 90% on overhead. You know, Anderson Cooper runs around you know, one week every year and charity CEOs slam the door in his face and people say, ha ha, that's why I don't give. I thought there was a different way. People wanted to help, they wanted to be generous, they just, they needed to trust. And I thought the biggest thing we would need to do from a business model approach was, was solve the money problem said, what if we could give away 100% of the public's money every single time without exception? And we would be so vigilant about the integrity of this model, we would even pay back credit card fees. So if one of you gave $1,000 and we actually only got $9,600 or $960, we would pay back that 4% and send every single intended penny to the field. I had no idea how we would make this work, but I opened up two bank accounts with $100 each and said, somehow we were gonna figure out how to make overhead cool and get people excited about paying for the operations and the staff so that we can go out with this very public, transparent promise. So money would not be fungible. We would know where it went. So the second thing was, let's just prove it. Let's build proof into everything that we do. Uh, we started in the same year as Google Earth. That was great for us. Google had given us this free place to put every single water point, the photo, the GPS proof, the name of the communities for every single person in the world to see. If we had 10,000 water projects, there would be 10,000 proved projects on Google Earth. This was so simple. Handheld GPS devices cost 100 bucks. Third thing, I really wanted to build a beautiful brand. You know, charities were, were typically they weren't amazing at branding. You know, they had some pretty bad websites, animated GIFs, uh, <laughs> a lot of white papers. There was a recent study about, uh, they looked at the PDFs on the World Bank's website. They found 70% had never been downloaded once. <laughs> there had to be a better way. Nick Kristof had written in the New York Times that people peddle toothpaste with more sophistication than all of the world's life-saving causes. So true, so sad, so broken. Where was the Apple? Where was the Nike of the charitable sector? You had these big brands, but sometimes people didn't even know what they did. And I thought you didn't need a lot of money to build a brand, you just needed really good taste. You needed good designers. So you need to care about the way things looked and what you presented into the world. The most important thing was what we would not do. We would not send Westerners to Africa. We would find and build up local organizations, local partners. We would help the communities through their own Local heroes, really. <laughs> and that's been the model today. We would not fly the charity water flag in 22 countries. So it started with a birthday party. The only thing I knew how to do to kick it off was to throw a party in a club. Got 700 people to come. I gave them open bar. Uh, and I charged them 20 bucks at the door and said, 100% uh, of your money will help people. A couple months later, we took the $15,000 that we raised to a refugee camp in northern Uganda, and we sent the photo and the GPS proof back to the people that attended the party. I always joke that some people don't remember coming to the party. I uh, said, well, <laughs> I was generous. That's great. But 
Seriously, we, we, people were just surprised that we told them where $20 went, that they could see impact, that we bothered to close the loop. And we said, let's just keep doing this on repeat until we can help more and more and more people. It has worked. Eight years later, uh, the organization has grown more like a startup than a nonprofit. We've now raised over $170 million. Uh, thanks to the generosity of 700,000 people, this is not how we keep score. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. Um, we made impact in 22 countries. Right now, 1,500 locals are employed on charity water projects. For us, the most important thing are the people getting clean water. And that's been just over 5 million people in those 22 countries, which is just a hard number to get you know, your head around. <clears throat> Couple things that worked. Um, direct mail sucked. It doesn't work. I didn't know anyone that was responding to people that bought you know, my, my physical mailing address and asked me to write a check for a charity I've never heard of. So we built a social first, or even a social only organization. We were the first charity to get a million followers on Twitter. We were the first nonprofit to use Instagram. We built this culture of early adoption and we believed that the stories of the future would travel through social networks. People would want to give online. They'd want to see their impact online. And we tried to connect our supporters around the world and be intentional about building community. We tried to use data to show people where their money goes and build uh, online products where we tie every single dollar to that actual project. Uh, we crowdsourced drilling rigs. Uh, our drilling rigs have GPS units mounted to them so you can actually track them and see where they are. Uh, they have Twitter accounts. Our drilling rigs tweet when they drill so you can see where they are. I mean, this is simple stuff, actually. Been using technology recently to ensure that projects are sustainable. We got a $5 million grant from Google to go and work on a sensor that we'd be able to put in these remote villages. At the same time, training local mechanics who could act on that data so that we know these projects are functioning for years and years in the future. Um, we had some failed attempts. Uh, this was a great idea of a solar sensor, but the minute a kid in the village put his arm on it, it snapped. <laughs> So it didn't work. Uh, and we finally have a sensor that's working. 60 of them are in Ethiopia right now. We're about to drop 3,000 sensors. And this data hasn't been made you know, beautifully yet, but you get the idea. We can sit in New York and see how much clean water is being used in these villages. And we think we can use this data to predict failure and, and to be able to inform better implementation of these projects going forward. Probably the biggest thing was we got personal and we gave our story away. Uh, some of you might have heard about this idea, but on our one year anniversary, I did not want to do another party in a nightclub. I said, what if I gave up my birthday? I had everything I needed. I didn't need an Amazon gift card. I didn't need a tie or a wallet or a pair of sneakers. 750 million people didn't have clean water. What if I could donate my birthday? What if I could, uh, what if I could use my birthday for good? So I thought the sticky thing might be to ask for my age in dollars. I was turning 32, everybody I knew had $32 that they could give for clean water, especially if 100% of the money went straight there. So to my surprise, after just emailing everyone I knew, I wound up raising $59,000. And uh, I said, wow, this is a big idea. Nobody needs more crap. You know, what if we got everyone to just donate their birthday? And this seven-year-old kid in Austin, Texas, starts knocking on doors. Well, he was turning seven, so he asked for $7 lived in an affluent neighborhood. <laughs> he raises 22 grand with his seventh birthday. <laughs> you know, he's getting $7 donations and uh, $77 donations, a couple 777s. Uh, we realized this was just something that everyone could do. Tony Hawk tweeted a few times, raise money for his birthday. Adam Lambert, a guy I had never heard of before, has tried to raise $29,000. He wound up raising $320,000 online through his fans. Uh, Jack Dorsey, who some of you guys know, has given up three birthdays, raised close to 200,000. Uh, Angela Arons, who's now at Apple, sent out one email, and her business community celebrated her and her work with $100,000 of donations. Will and Jada gave up their birthdays, asked their fans to donate. They actually came with us to see uh, the impact they'd made in Ethiopia. What was most exciting for us, though, was not famous people. It wasn't you know, business celebrities. It was six-year-olds named Lori, it was 16 year olds in the middle of the country, like uh, Maggie, 89 year olds, like Nona Ween. And it was a beautiful concept. You know, she says here, I'm turning 89, I'd like to make that possible for more people. 
And she's realizing here she has double the life expectancy in so many of these countries where we work. Our birthdays, so people could have more birthdays. Some people said, I can't wait. I got to do something now. I have something else I can bring to this. And they started climbing mountains, trying to raise a dollar a foot, or jumping out of planes. Or uh, Sarah Peck from San Francisco said, if I raise 30 grand for my 30th birthday, I will swim naked from Alcatraz uh, to San Francisco. And of course, her friends made sure that she did reach $30,000. And she did it. Alex and Kristen gave up their wedding gifts. We've had people donate their honeymoon money. We've had people bike across the country. We've had people make charity water flags sail the Atlantic. Uh, We've had people walk across America. Riley ate rice and beans for an entire month, raised $15,000. Last week, I was in Vancouver with Maddie. She did 12 lemonade stands, one of them in the rain. The last lemonade stand she did, she convinced the local band to stand at her lemonade stand and play. Sold $5,346. It's a six-year-old that just said, it's not okay the kids are drinking dirty water simply because of where they're born. We realized that this wasn't our story. <laughs> Thank you, guys. So this, was, uh, this had become the story of our supporters, and we needed to be very intentional about giving it away, about celebrating them, about telling their stories telling the stories of our beneficiaries, of our amazing local partners who are out there drilling 29 out of 30 days a month, of the six-year-olds, of the nine-year-olds, of the 89-year-olds, of the 78-year-old guy right now in San Francisco who says, if I reach my goal for my 78th birthday, I will do the waltz 78 times in consecutive. We had to tell these stories and we had to build community around it. Last year was our biggest year of impact. We helped one million people in a single year, which is 2,700 people every single day or one person every 30 seconds. And I'm really interested in trying to take back some of these statistics about death and dying. Let's talk about the people that are getting help. Let's talk about the world becoming better because of the generosity and the empathy and the the passion and creativity that people are bringing to issues like this and to others. Five million people is, is great. 750 million people are still out there. And we have a lot more work to be done. So standing in front of so many people. Um, I'll ask the question, what will you guys do? What could you bring to this issue? You know, maybe it's as simple as donating your next birthday. I have done six now. It's an amazing thing. It's simple. I promise you, you don't need the stuff that you're going to get. You probably don't even like some of the stuff that you get. The amazing thing about the birthday campaign is that the average person raises over $1,200. And they bring in 15 new people to the cause. So imagine this room, right? A thousand people. If you all just simply gave up your birthday and you were average, which you are not, if you're here in this room, you'd raise a million dollars for clean water. And you'd bring in 15,000 people who might go and do likewise. You could raise much more than you could give. You could influence much more than, than the check that you could write. It's an amazing thing to be able to do. I've done it personally. I've seen the impact to be able to take a child just because of where they're born who's drinking water like this, pay for locals to come in and help their own communities and turn that dirty water into clean water. It's one of the most amazing blessings and privileges that I've had the honor of of being able to do over the last eight years. So I would invite you guys into that. Uh, I eat my own dog food. I do it every single year. You can go to charitywater.org slash birthdays. Even if it's a year from now, you can simply pledge, and we remind you a month before and send you simple instructions. Or maybe you have something else you could bring. Maybe there's something entirely different and creative. We have a guy in Afghanistan writing haikus for Charity Water. Uh, We've had scrapbookers in France put scrapbook together and, and, and raise tens of thousands of dollars. Maybe it's a different issue that you're passionate about. Maybe it's education or justice or, or hunger or shelter. I would just encourage you guys to, uh, to be positive, to, you know, it is getting better out there. I can tell you that. It is getting better, and it's worth doing, and it's worth bringing what you have towards it. So that's all, guys. Thank you so much for having me, and um, it's been great to be here.